Hello and welcome back to Chapter 11, Capillary or Dermal Blood Collection, Blood Specimen Lecture Part 2. Now other concerns that we have to consider whenever we're doing a capillary blood or dermal draw on a patient is that we most and foremost must use safety measurements. We always have to make sure that everything is sterile or single use only, which all the equipment is. After we use it, we dispose of it in its proper destination of spot, be it the sharps, the biohazard bag, or the biohazard trash can. We also have to make sure that we're using the correct depth or device on a patient. As we know, we have to make sure that if we're doing a newborn or a kid, that the depth that we do a capillary puncture for doesn't go no more than two millimeters. With adults, it's pretty much the same thing, two to three millimeters on an adult because we are sticking the finger on an adult. And always remember never to over squeeze or massage the finger because we don't want to contaminate the specimen with intrastellar fluid. We want arterial blood, which is what you're going to get from a capillary draw because arterial is the biggest vessel besides the venues that we'll get arterial blood from. Never use and make sure you use the proper equipment. If you're gonna stick an adult, make sure you use an adult equipment versus if you're sticking a pee, you won't wanna use an adult lancet or adult equipment to do a pee's capillary draw. Whenever you are in a home setting, are you doing, are you a home healthcare service? representative, you want to make sure that the patient's devices are sterile, clean, and that they are set appropriate and that they've been calibrated appropriately because the one thing we're using their machine to do a calculation off of their blood sugar if we're checking their blood sugar or um, like I said later on we're going to learn about different other POCT testing equipment because it's not only that, we can also check H and H, we can check cholesterol levels. So we wanna make sure all those are calibrated correctly and accurately. Now, when we're doing micro collection, we always have to make sure that we acquire, just like when we use regular evacuated tubes, we always have to make sure that we fill it to the correct volume. We don't wanna overfill it and we don't wanna underfill it due to the fact that if we underfill it you'll get erroneous test results the same way if you overfill it it's going to give erroneous test results because it's not going to read properly and like evacuated tubes the micro collection tubes do have to be inverted also because it does have an additive in those tubes it's just the order of draw is different from a regular evacuated tube system as you know being that it is a capillary draw or finger stick or dermal stick and we're using micro collection tubes we know that we have to draw the hematology first we have to draw all hematology tubes first and then we draw any other tubes that has additives and then the last thing is our non-additive tube Depending on the manufacturer or different, depending on the device that you're using, most devices say we have to wipe the first drop of blood away before we can get an accurate, um, an accurate analysis of from the test. So we will remove the first drop of blood according to the directions, so we can get a more accurate test result. And as I said before, if we're doing a micro collection process it's it's the opposite of when we do an evacuated tube system whereas with an evacuated tube system if we have blood cultures ordered we would do blood cultures first then light blue then we will go down to our our non-additive or our waste tube as we call it then we go to our sst and then we go to our green top purple top and so on and so forth but in a micro collection tube, we would, if we were so ordered, we would get blood gases first, and then we would go down into our 
purple top or a hematology test tube, which is our purple top, our EDTA tube. And then we will go down to our other tubes that have additives, which is our red or our gold top, depending on if it has a additive in that specific tube. And then we will go to our non-additive tube. And those are the ones that don't have any additives. Now we're going to talk about blood smears. Blood smears are used to count white in red blood cells to see if they're multiplying appropriately, if they're multiplying the way that they should be, our red and our white blood cells, or it's just to count to see if we're producing enough red and white blood cells. So when we're doing a slide, there are many ways we can do a slide. We can actually collect a drop from um, our capillary tube and drop a drop onto a micro a micro slide or we can collect a, a, a evacuated tube cyst, a tube the EDTA tube and there's a special device in the lab that they cap off into the EDTA tube to where it'll precisely give off a drop of blood onto a microscopic slide now, when we do in the microscopic slides, they will also stain those slides. So it'll make it easier to tell the difference between a red blood cell and a white blood cell. So they can count it appropriately. So basically how we would do that, you would take a look at procedure 11.1. Procedure 11.1 describes how we are to make a slide or blood smear for counting white and red blood cells. So basically what we would do is we would draw blood in an EDTA tube or purple top as it's called. We would put a drop onto the bottom half of the slide. We would take another slide and we would push forward and we would slide back, back forward into a feathered angle. So we would feather the specimen. So it will smear. That's why they call it a blood smear, because we're actually smearing out the blood sample, or should I say thinning out the blood sample so we can see all those cells. And once we do that smear, it gets stained. So we can tell the difference between a red and a white blood cell. So when I say we take a special device in the lab, if you look, take a look at 1116, figure 1116 in your book, it's a device that he's putting on top of the ETTA tube. So he'll be able, and it looks, it's just a little plastic little adapter that up here, you press on it, and it actually simply, simply just puts a, a drop onto the microscopic slide. As you can see in figure 18, he depressed it and it made a perfect little dot of blood. So 11, 19, he's showing you how he did it. And now he's taking his other second slide. He slid up and now he's going back. And now he's going forward in the next one. And that's how we would make a blood smear slide. And this is what we call feathering out because it kind of looks like a bird's feather when it feathers out, when we thin it out. <clears throat> Sometimes you can have an error with a microscopic fly. You can actually depress too big of a dot. And when you go to smear it, it won't smear as thin as it should be because it's too big of a dot. That means it has too much blood on it. So therefore you won't be able to distort, you won't be able to tell really good the red and white blood cells because it's too thick and it's too much on the slide. So due to a big large drop, or you might have delayed too long in making the slide. Actually the drop of blood that you dispersed into onto the slide has started to dry and when you went to spread it or smear it it wouldn't smear correctly because it was it was starting to dry out or you could have a chipped or crack slide and it'll it won't read correctly because it's going through the cracks in the slide <clears throat> 
it's not a smooth surface the same thing happens is just like we can't blow our fan um a patient's arm to dry it is pretty much the same way with a blood smear also we cannot blow on it to dry it it has to dry on its own on the air dry and please whatever whatever you do whatever you do please make sure you label your slide you need to know what patient you just so before when you smear in it after you smear it and it dries make sure you label it to say okay this purple top went with this blood smear that is very important to label as always we label everything label 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 all your little document 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 so whatever we don't use of course gets discarded Hence, the second slide that we use to smear it out or to spread out the sample, that goes in the sharps container because it is glass and it does have blood on it. We also know as everything, we always have to sterilize our hands before and after. We have to wear gloves, that's a gimme. Now, most of the time we don't do, it just depends on the hospital you're working in. I mean, I really, I know when I worked in the lab slides weren't made until you got in the lab itself and most of the time the techs make the slides because they're the ones who's doing the count i really hadn't had to make any slides now that's not saying if you work for lab, some like lab core the main office and you're not just a collection station if you're in the main office it's not to say that you won't be making any slides for the text to read so it just depends on the facility that you're working at. Now, when you are doing, or if you're in a doctor's office and you make a slide to be delivered to the lab for them to read it, you have to be mindful on how it's transported because remember, slides are glass. So you must always make sure you transport it and pack it to where it won't break a crack in half so the labs can read it and prepare for it. As you know, we use um, the difference between venous blood and capillary blood is, as you know, venous blood is has no oxygen. It's very dark. Where capillary blood is more arterial than it is venal because it's more concentrated in the air, um, arterial blood than the venues or the venues. Also due to the fact that capillary blood, you can, just as well as venous blood, you can check certain things off because it has just the amount of concentration as it does in venal blood. You can still check your potassium level, your total protein, your calcium. It's just lower in your capillary blood than it is in your venous blood. So therefore, if you check in any of those tests, you really don't want a capillary sample of it because it's not going to be that accurate. You want venal because venal is going to have more of a concentration of it than in a capillary will. Microhemocrat. These are collected in a capillary tube and it's the green top that contains heparin. And basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna collect those and it's gonna be a half, well, they say two thirds full in order to um, get an accurate result. And we have to be very mindful because we don't want any blood exposure because you a micro collection tube, it's basically you popping the top off and the, and the tube itself has a scoop and you're literally scooping the blood into the micro collection container. So we have to be very mindful of any blood borne pathogens that are out there are we, because we are highly exposed to blood. Unlike an evacuated tube, we're not per se exposed to any blood exposures because it's going straight into a tube. Unlike a capillary, we have to literally put it into a tube. Now, as I said earlier, when we are collecting blood samples through a microcollection sample kit, 
through the little bitty little bit we call them baby tubes we also use those on adults too but most of the time they're used on infants and children as I said, the order of draw is backwards. We collect any and all hematology specimens first and foremost because why? Capillary blood samples will clot off faster than a venal sample will clot off. So we want to make sure we get the hematology specimen first and foremost because it can't clot. Remember, hematology, want, they want it to where they can check your H&H &H and your hemocrats and your hemoglobins and it can't be clotted off. So we would take our hematology specimens first because we don't want it to start clotting. Now, another thing we can check through a capillary blood sample is we can check the blood's pH level and we can also do a blood gas determination off of a capillary sample. Now, we would also, if we do, we would collect it through a capillary sample. Now, that's the little slender glass tubes that we use in lab when we do in finger, when I tell you to take a capillary, we're talking about those slender little tubes. Now, remember, we use the blue ones. If you look at it, it has a ring of blue in it because the blue one has um, sodium citrate, so it's not, it's not going to clot. Now they do have other ones. They have a green ring, a black ring, and a red ring, just like the evacuated tubes. Each one has a different additive within that capillary cylinder. Now when you're collecting capillary sticks, as we know, just like with evacuated tubes, we have a chance of stuff hemolyzing. So the most thing we have to be careful for before we puncture the patient's finger we have to make sure that the alcohol is 100 completely dry now when we do I make y'all do a glucose test first and y'all always saying Miss Tina is giving me an error and I'm like well how did your bead of blood come out did it come out in a perfect little bead or did it kind of spread out a little bit and you kind of had to chase it and you say, well, it kind of spread out a little bit. That's because the alcohol didn't completely dry. So you're going to get an error. Try another finger and wait for the alcohol to dry before you do the skin punk, the finger stick. And that way you'll get less chances of the blood getting hemolyzed. Over excessive milking of the finger. We don't want to milk the finger. Constantly. If we're milking the finger more times than we're pulling blood from a squeeze, then we know we're not going to get a very accurate sample. That means that's null and void. Pick another finger. And that concludes our second lecture of chapter 11. If you have any questions, about capillary or dermal draws, feel free to text or message me at any time. As I said before, you always have to be mindful and make sure, just like when we do a venipuncture, is once you complete everything, make sure you do your proper hand hygiene, thank the patient, leave out the room, make sure you label everything before you leave the patient, make sure you double check everything, make sure everything is packed and stored the way it's supposed to be before you do anything. Just like with an evacuated tube system, capillary specimens are the same way. They're just more highly, more cautious you have to be with them because there's a lot of glassware you're dealing with. So you have to be mindful on how you pack it and how it's stored and how you transport it because it is mostly glass products and we don't want it to crack, fray, or anything else. So this is definitely it of lecture 11, lecture two. As I said before, if you have any questions, feel free to message me or text me. And I'll say goodbye and talk to y'all next time.